Okay, so I'm going to talk, uh, give an introduction to network visualization and analysis with Cytoscape, and then a brief demo of Cytoscape, and then I'll talk about enrichment map, and then we can have a lab. And uh, um, I'll try to keep it short so we can extend the lab time as much as possible, because that's usually quite valuable. Okay, so um, the uh, this is a, a little bit of a, um, we'll talk more about networks tomorrow, but You'll see why I'm giving the Cytoscape demo today, because Enrichment Map, well, main reason is Enrichment Map is a network visualization of the results that we, we just generated. Um, okay, so um, uh, network visualization and analysis is, um, we, we uh, so the things that I'll cover are just an introduction to networks uh, briefly, and you'll hear more about that tomorrow. Uh, an introduction to network visualization, and discussion of Cytoscape um, and network analysis fairly briefly, and then we'll just give a demo of Cytoscape. I think you guys have used it already, but having a tour might be a little bit useful or somewhat useful. Okay, so we assigned this paper uh, for you guys to read in advance um, to save time in the, in the workshop so we can go over this stuff more quickly. Um, but if you didn't get a chance to read this, it's just like two or three pages. Uh, about how to visually interpret biological data using networks. The main idea is that networks represent relationships. And if you have any kind of data that's rich in relationships, then it's much easier to visualize it and consider it when you think about it as a network rather than as a table. So um, networks, relationships can be represented as a table as well, like you know, A connects to B, B connects to C. You have this long table of relationships but if you visualize it as a network, then it's it's much more useful for discovering relationships in large data sets that might be interesting, um, much better than tables, as I mentioned. Okay, there's different types of relationships that people typically care about in biology. So physical relationships like protein-protein interaction, regulatory relationships like microRNA or transcription factor regulates genes expression, genetic relationships like synthetic lethal events like Gene A, when knocked out, doesn't do anything. Gene B, when knocked out, doesn't do anything, but knock them both out together and the system dot, the, the system fails. That's a type, spe special type of genetic relationship, and there are others. And functional interactions are just, my view, any kind of connection between genes that are functionally related. I mentioned some of those this morning. Um, networks are uh, useful for discovering relationships and also for visualizing data and including visualizing multiple different types of data together. And you can see interesting patterns more, you know, quite readily when you visualize networks um, as, uh, visualize data as networks. And finally, they're quite useful for network analysis. So has anyone heard of the idea of six degrees of separation? Anybody heard of this? Does anybody know about the experiment that was used to define it? So this uh, psychologist, I think so psychologist, social psychologist Stanley Milgram, famous in his field, um, in the 60s, came up with this idea that he wanted to figure out how closely people are connected. So he came up with this experiment where people would send postcards to someone in from Boston. They would send postcards from Boston, and they have to get to New York. And um, the per they had the person's na name and occupation, I think, but they didn't have the address. So this was before the internet. So um, people had to send postcards to people they thought would be closer to this person. So probably they'd send postcards to friends in New York or something, and then, you know, then it would somehow filter to that person. And each time someone received a postcard, they were instructed to send a postcard back to the, the scientist who, who could then track where the postcards were going. And after trying this out, it turned out that most of the postcards actually were able to reach their destination, and uh, the average took six Hops. So that's where this idea comes from. I, it's much, I'm sure it's much closer now um, with the, you know, Facebook. But the point is, it's just a fun, um, it's a fun uh, example that illustrates the concept of a network, in this case, a social network. And in the 60s, this person had to create this elaborate postcard experiment, probably took a long time, to figure out how people were connected. Um, uh, and, and basically, it tried to answer the question, 
you know, how people are connected, if they're connected, how, you know, how are they connected. Um, in computer science, people, if you have a network represented in a computer, you can answer this question very easily using standard algorithms. Uh, so for instance, there's a standard algorithm in computer science that people learn in like first or second year computer science called shortest path by breadth first search. And um, it's proven mathematically to find a path between two nodes if they're connected. And uh, if they are connected, it will find the shortest path or one of the shortest paths. Uh, if they're not connected, it will clearly say they're not connected. Now, this is an example of um, you know, how you can use uh, algorithms in computer science to answer, answer a question about a network. And uh, it turns out there are a lot of uh, algorithms in computer science in the field of graph theory. In computer science, people call networks graphs. We don't use that term usually because most people, when you think of a graph, you think of a plot. Um, so it's more clear to say network. But in the computer science field of graph theory, uh, there's a rich library of algorithms that answer all sorts of questions like this. This is a simple example. And so you might be able to use these questions for bio to, these uh, algorithms to answer biological questions. In this case, the simple example would be I have a big network of protein interactions, and I want to know how these two proteins are, my two proteins of interest are connected. If they're connected, then how are they connected? And this algorithm will definitely, will like guarantee a solution to that um, optimally. And so we don't really have to think so much about that. We just take this algorithm and we use it. And as I mentioned, there are many algorithms and people have figured out different ways of using them to answer questions um, in biology. Now this particular example is very simple and the shortest path might not be the most biologically relevant one, but at least it illustrates the, the idea. Um, and so people have spent a number, maybe about 15 years thinking about this um, network analysis field and have come up with all sorts of interesting network analysis methods that are available to use. So gene function prediction we'll hear about tomorrow is based on network analysis. Uh, detection clustering networks in which you can use to find protein complexes in, in um, protein interaction networks. You can use it to um, cluster other type of data. Uh, looking at network evolution, predicting new interactions um, are sort of the, some of the basic applications. And there's also more uh, applied applications to disease research, for instance, Identif identifying a disease, a region of a network that is uh, enriched in genes that are associated with a disease in some way, like mutated in the disease or differentially expressed in the disease. And uh, people have also looked at subnetwork-based diagnosis. So can you use network information to improve biomarker de detection? People have found that you can. Uh, and, um, and, and looking at how um, uh, specific mechanisms might be affected by mutations. So these are just some examples, and I provided these here with specific uh, callouts to specific um, software that's available mostly in, in Cytoscape. Uh, just as a quick example, again, we, we um, assigned pre-reading so we could make this shorter in this particular case and focus more on more other more interesting topics. Um, but if you have any questions, so this is just a very quick overview, but if you have any questions, let me know. Um, what's missing in the typical network analysis? Um, I, don't, uh, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but someone asked the question about, um, you know, tissue-specific data or pathway. Kind of think about this particular slide in general with all of the data that we're using, like pathway databases and tomorrow network databases, um, that these pathways and networks are typically represented as static processes. Even though we know they're dynamic, we just see one snapshot of them. And it usually represents the set of things that could happen um, at any time. Um, you could do detailed mathematical simulations of pathways. People typically don't do those because we usually don't have a lot of information available that's required, like rate constants for enzymatic reactions. Um, it, we don't also consider the structure of the protein. So usually proteins are just represented as, or genes are just represented as single elements, like atomic elements, um, even though we know that there's a lot of detailed information within structure within genes and proteins, like promoters and domains and things like that. So usually we don't see that information when we look at pathways and, and networks, but it, obviously it's important. And then the context is something we, we, we mentioned this morning. Okay, so that's very quick. Um, 
Uh, the main point is that networks are useful for seeing relationships in large data sets. Uh, a key point is that it's important to understand what the nodes and edges mean. So whenever you see a network, it could represent different things, and you have to ask what the circles and lines mean. Um, we use the terminology nodes for the circles and edges for the lines. Uh, and um, uh, we'll, what we'll see more tomorrow is sort of different biological questions that you can answer using network information. Um, so it's, uh, and because there's so many possible topics available, uh, uh, sort of so many tools and topics and different types of questions that people have, asked, ans have uh, answered with network analysis, um, often it's good to determine your question and search for a solution so you can ask, you know, I have this problem. Um, you can go to like the Cytoscape mailing list, Cytoscape help desk mailing list, and ask, you know, is there any tool out there for doing an analysis of this type of data? And you usually get some kind of recommended response. Um, so, uh, moving on quickly, uh, network visualization and analysis can be uh, accomplished using Cytoscape. Cytoscape is a free software tool that is a desktop Java application, just similar to GSEA. Uh, so you can download it and install it on your computer, as, as you guys have done. And you guys, uh, again, we assigned trying to go through Cytoscape and the pre-reading, so you can go through the tutorials, so we don't have to do that here. And um, But I will give you a quick demo and just a couple of pieces of information about it. So as I mentioned, it's free software. Uh, it's the most popular software available for network analysis. There are others, but this is the one that, that most people use. It's developed by a large consortium of um, individuals. My lab is one of the labs that contribute to this. Um, people in, in uh, San Diego and San Francisco and Seattle and Paris and uh, Amsterdam and other places and some companies are involved in building the software. It's an open source software tool, which means that it's freely available. All the source code is freely available and people contribute to it in a team effort. And we do that because we use this type, we need this type of software in our own research, and um, and we don't want to build it by ourselves. So anyone who's available to build it is welcome to contribute. Um, it by default handles network visualization and some analysis, but most of the analysis comes from um, pulling in uh, from downloading apps, which I guess you guys also looked at. Uh, so these are the, sort of the basic things that you can do with it: manipulate networks, filter and query, lay out the network, and there's some databases you can search. Um, the real power comes from apps. So this is an old picture. Uh, there's a Cytoscape app store, and there are um, 300 apps that currently, over 300 apps that currently extend the functionality of the system. Uh, there are lots of users. Um, I think these numbers are out of date, but it's a very large community of users, not just in biology. And the reason I'm saying that is because there are uh, that community of users has created a a, a, a a good knowledge base online that you can take advantage of. So documentation, data sets, mailing lists, there's tutorials which you guys know about, um, but you can easily take advantage of these mailing lists. I, I didn't, I forgot to actually list the mailing list here, but on the Cytoscape homepage there's a link to the Cytoscape help desk. If you ever have any questions about Cytoscape, you can ask you can ask it on that mailing list, and it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll get a response within a week. We we answer we make sure that all the questions are answered every Thursday. So if you're wondering, um, so uh, and um, there's a, this this picture just illustrates that there's a community of people that these are all developers of Cytoscape, and they spelled out the Cytoscape a few years ago in front of our building. So that's just a fun uh, picture. Um, okay, so speeding through this again. Cytoscape is useful free software for network visualization and analysis, and it provides basic network manipulation features, and then apps are available to extend its functionality. Okay, I'm going to switch to a demo here. Okay, so um, this is Cytoscape 3.4. Um, we just recommended that you guys use this one because we've tested our apps uh, for this workshop for that. The current version of Cytoscape is 3.5 point something, and 3.6 is under development. We roughly release one every uh, new version every six months or so, but um, um, most of the, uh, and, and there's there are various new features, but uh, the core features have been very stable for a long time, so this one is fine for our use here. Um, 
Okay, so one of the things I'm going to do first is just quickly load up uh, some sample data. I'm just I'm just loading up uh, a session file that comes as an example. It's a yeast network of protein interactions and protein DNA interactions. Um, so I think most people tried this out and uh, and were able to see uh, networks. So Cytoscape allows you to you know browse around. You can click and move things around. You can select um, you can select uh, different um, things and move them around. Uh, so each of these circles, as I mentioned, is a node, and the lines are edges. Um, once you get your data, once you get a network into Cytoscape, um, you know one of the first things that you might do is lay thing lay the network out. Um, in the layout menu, there are a number of layouts uh, like um, Wi Files Organic. Um, if you click on these things, you'll get different different layouts. Um, here is. I'm just going to go through a couple of examples. Here's a hierarchical version of this network. So you can see that it's kind of tried to lay it out in a hierarchy. Um, oops. Here's a circular layout, so it, I try to identify cycles. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, the, the main point I wanted to mention here is that there are lots of layouts, and if you're interested in uh, it's. I recommend that you try a bunch of them out just to see which ones are available. And typically, the um, uh, one type of layout called force directed, um, which happens to be one of these Y files layouts, is like Y files organic. Um, they have different names. Sometimes they're interesting and useful names. Sometimes not so interesting. Um, but in general, anything that says force directed or spring embedded is the same type of algorithm that's a kind of standard one to use but you can try other ones if you have tree like data then a hierarchical layout is better um, and uh, so you can try these out and see which ones work for your network um, the force directed layout algorithms um, they basically model the network as the network nodes as repe re repelling um, forces basically like for instance like charged like charges, and they'll push away from each other. And then this, the edges are usually um, pulling the nodes together. So if you have nodes that are connected, they'll be pulled together, but the nodes will repel each other, so they'll kind of bounce around to be pulling apart from each other. Um, so what that does is it reduces overlap. So nodes shouldn't be on top of each other, otherwise they, it gets confusing. And also the edges should have not too many crossings. Um, if they have too many crossings, then you get this hairball. Um, everything looks like everything's connected to everything else. So, um, so these layout algorithms try to reduce the overlap of different components visually, and they try to identify major structures in the network. So if you have regions that are highly connected, they'll be grouped together. Um, let's see if I can look at an example here. You can use this box to move around. So like here, for instance, there's a, a, like a, connected, a, a region that's fairly connected. Like this region is highly connected. Um, okay, so you can um, you can use your your mouse center wheel or your two finger scrolling on the on the Mac to zoom in and out, uh, and also these buttons here. Um, you can zoom into something of interest, uh, or just zoom out to the whole network, or zoom in and out incrementally. Um, let's see. You can also take some part of the network and you can make a new network out of it. So I'm going to say a new network from selected nodes, all edges, and that makes a new network just from the parts that I selected, and I can lay that out again. I'm just going to click this um, preferred layout, which is one of the four directed layouts. So if you are interested in just a part of the network, you can select it and make a new network out of it and lay that out and usually get a better layout. The bigger the network is, the harder it is to lay it out. So if you make smaller versions of the network somehow by filtering it somehow, then you'll usually get a better view, although it, it's separated from the big network. So here on the um, I guess your left, you can see that you can go back and forth between these two, these two networks that I just made. 
Um, these numbers here show you the number of nodes and edges. Um, let's see, importantly, if you click on a node or you select some set of nodes, you can see information about these nodes. And this information is just happens to be loaded up in the in the session file that I loaded, the project file that I loaded. But you actually are able to add your own data. Um, I won't go through that too much. But um, so these are but a bunch of example pieces of information. And then importantly, just to know that the node table shows the node information about nodes and edge table shows information about edges. And network we don't use too much, it's information about the whole network. And there could be additional tabs here that pop up with different apps. Um, let's see. A uh, couple of other things that I wanted to mention. Um, one is uh, selection. So you can create a filter that selects uh, by different criteria. So I'm going to select, if I, if I click, I'll show you exactly where this comes from in a second, but someone had previously computed a bunch of statistics about this network, included the, including the number of connections per gene. Um, and uh, so that's called the node degree, and it just happens to, happens to be loaded up here already. Um, if you compute, you, there are apps that allow you to compute that yourself. If you're interested, I can tell you more about that during the lab. Uh, the, um, but just to illustrate how this filter works, you can create a filter based on a node or edge attribute, and then you can, um, you can change the filter. And as I'm changing it here, it's, it's live updating. So this is now selecting everything between 8 and 18 connections, and you can see that um, only a few nodes are, are selected. Um, you can see what happens there. So you can create any number of filters and make Boolean combinations. Um, and then I think lastly, I wanted to illustrate this um, style panel. So uh, any attribute here, in this case, for instance, I have a bunch of gene expression data loaded up. Um, these are yeast gene expression um, full change, log2 full change uh, data points that are um, uh, defined based on experiments where people have knocked out individual genes and they've captured the expression values and the p-values associated with those. So this sig is significance and it's a p-value and exp is expression value and it's uh, log2 full change. And so um, you can take any of the information in the table and you can map it to visual properties. So um, I'm going to take these expression colors and these expression colors I think are, somebody already mapped these in this um, uh, session file. So if I click on fill color, that's the color of the, of the, um, the nodes. Um, you can see that somebody took GAL1 expression values and they used a continuous mapping function to map to a blue to yellow gradient. Um, so you can change that. Let's change it to one of the other expression values, um, like GAL80. And I, I change that and then everything's updated here. So now these expression values are uh, mapped to, uh, the GAL80 expression values are mapped to color. And if, if I click here, I double click here, I can change this. Um, I can change, if I don't like yellow, I can change it to red. Um, and now everything's mapped from blue to red, etc. So this is highly configurable. You can change, um, I can change the uh, border width. I can make the border width bigger, like say, make big thick borders, or even say thicker borders. Okay, so now the borders are really thick, and I can make the border color um, I'll just quickly add another section here. So now um, I've mapped two different gene expression values to the node. So one 
one is on the border and one is on the center and you know you can sort of see here that some of the you know you know now I, I'm basically now comparing two gene expression um, signatures and it's a little bit I think I made the border too thick um, because it's including the center so, yeah so you can um, you can see now that there's certain patterns like I might see things that are upregulated in two conditions or downregulated in one and upregulated in another. So this illustrates how you can overlay multiple different types of data together on the network. And this is illustrating how you can kind of integrate that data. So if you have different experiments, you might be able to integrate the data in different ways. And there are more complicated ways of doing this. Um, one of them, you can actually plot like a time series as a chart in the software and each node will get a little chart on it and there's a whole range of charts, pie charts and line charts and bar charts um, and uh, and so that's that's a, this is sort of the power of Cytoscape is this style panel here where you can take any data and map it to any visual property uh, and there are lots of different visual properties available, different colors, widths, shapes, lines, the thickness of the lines um, and such like that. Okay, so um, not set escape. Okay, so um, so we did the introduction to set escape so that I can tell you about this, which is what we really wanted to talk about uh, this today, and, and that will be the focus of the lab. Um, and that is uh, helping to interpret the results of the enrichment tests that we've learned about for the for the previous part of this day. Um, okay, so enrichment analysis, uh, as we've learned about, is an excellent idea. Uh, it's been used in tens of thousands of papers. Um, pretty much everybody who runs genomics kind of runs this type of pathway analysis, pathway enrichment analysis by default usually. Um, and it generates these nice tables of pathways and scores. Um, but one of the problems with it is, as I alluded to this morning, or just described this morning, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of redundancy in the pathway database. So um, when you look at these long lists, you often notice that there are pathways that are related to each other, um, like uh, B cell mediated immunity and myeloid cell differentiation. Um, if you were an immunologist, you would immediately recognize a number of these pathways as being related um, to immunology, but they don't always say they don't always use the word immune or something else. So if you know a lot of biology, you can sort of relate these things together. But it, it, especially in long lists, it's time consuming. And, and you'd also like to group all of the similar things. So uh, my lab uh, developed um, a tool that helps visualize the results of enrichment analysis. Uh, we call it enrichment map. Um, there, there's one other tool like this called Clugo that's available in Cytoscape. Um, enrichment map is uh, uh, a bit more modular because it supports GSEA and Clugo just does gene ontology enrichment analysis with the hypergeometric test. So we made enrichment map to, uh, avail uh, to support more a wider variety of enrichment analysis methods. Um, so the basic idea is that you can take your gene sets and you can visualize it as a network and I'll explain how this works. So we learned about ranked gene lists and GSEA, um, and we know that we can get genes pathways that are enriched in the top part of the list and also in the bottom part of our ranked gene list. So what we do is we take this data, like all the data from GSEA that you just, um, or G profiler that you, that you just used, and we can load it into enrichment map. Enrichment map color, uh, takes each pathway and converts it into a node in Cytoscape. And the color, the significant score is uh, translated to the color, just like in Cytoscape, I showed you how you can take gene expression and map it to a color of the node. In this case, we took the significant score of the pathway enrichment analysis and mapped it to the color of the node. Um, the number of genes in the in the pathway is proportional to the gene set size. The sorry is proportional to the node size, and these aren't mapped correctly here. But bigger nodes will be bigger pathways, more genes, and then. Um, Connections between pathways indicate crosstalk or shared genes. So a thicker the edge, the more overlap there is between the pathways. So cell cycle and spindle have a lot of genes in common, and so they get a thick connection. Um, proteasome shares no genes with the spindle, so it doesn't have a connection. Um, the, the 
in this case, we, we use GSEA, so we get pathways that are enriched on the top of the list. Those are colored red, uh, and in the bottom of the list are colored blue. So in general, you can kind of think of these as enriched in A versus B, and these are enriched in B versus A. For those of you who are interested, these edges are just computed using this simple overlap score. Actually, there's a couple of scores that, that are available. So I'll just go through sort of the, the use cases of enrichment map. Um, we took a data set of, for, the, for this demo, or for this presentation, we took a data set, a uh, published data set of gene expression that um, was measured from breast cancer cells that were treated with estrogen or untreated. So they had multiple time points. At one of the time points, they had three replicates of estrogen-treated cells versus three replicates of estrogen not, you know, untreated cells. We ran through our pathway enrichment analysis with GSEA, and then we make up uh, 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 an, an enrichment map. Oops. So, sorry. Um, so this is uh, what the enrichment map looks like, and so you can see it provides a very nice visual overview of the pathways. Um, and you can see that there's a bunch of pathways. So each of these circles is a pathway again, um, and all of these pathways are related to each other. They have connections, and we said that they're all related to translation. You can zoom in on one of these things. So you can zoom in, and you can see the actual pathway names like microtubule organizing center, centrosome, and these, these in this case are all gene ontology terms, um, biological process terms mostly. Um, so the, um, actually these might be um, cellular component terms as well in this particular case, but we would have biological process terms by default. So again, you can sort of see very quickly that uh, there's a bunch of pathways that are up and a bunch of pathways that are down. I usually call the group of pathways a theme, like a functional theme. So this is like a translation theme, this is a microtubule cytoskeleton theme, and um, again, you can just view these much quicker. So the, the basic idea is that this is a visualization technique that helps you more quickly process the data from all the results of enrichment analysis. Okay, so here's an example where you have two time points, um, and in this case, we're mapping just like I showed you in Cytoscape, the enrichment score at the early time point to the middle of the node and the enrichment score at the late time point to the border of the node. And so you can see that most of the nodes are all red or all blue. That means that they're, the pathways are enriched in both time points. But this, you know, a couple of pathways like ubiquitin-dependent protein uh, degradation is only enriched at the late time point. So in the early time point, it's not enriched in cases in treated versus control. And you can actually look at the heat map if you load your expression data into enrichment map, and you can see that indeed, um, you know, this particular pathway, which is APC-dependent protein degradation, the gene expression is basically the similar in treated and untreated, but at, 20, at the late time point, it's very different. And so that's what this is highlighting. And here's an example of the reverse pattern. Okay, so the third case, um, third and last case is um, using um, an additional gene set to relate to all the pathways that you've um, visualized. So here we took gene expression data that was uh, measured in a knockout of a microRNA in heart in, ma in mouse and um, all of these red and blue circles here represent pathways that are going up and down and then because this was a microRNA knockout experiment. We took the predicted targets of this microRNA. And we represented that set of predicted targets as another node. In this case, a little triangle here. And then we did the same type of, we, we basically measured a uh, computer statistic that looks at the overlap of targets with these pathways. And what we can see is that some of the pathways have a lot of microRNA targets in them, and some of them don't. So as you might expect, the pathways that are going up uh, have a lot of microRNA targets in because when you remove the microRNA target, the microRNA, which is a negative regulator, you expect its targets to go up, um, and the you know the ones that are going down don't have that. So we, we assume that in general um, that's validating the fact that these the the idea that microRNA is targeting these these processes, but it's not targeting all the processes that go up. Some of them don't have any microRNA targets, so this would give you some information perhaps about which pathways are being directly regulated for the, by the microRNA and which ones are indirect. So that starts giving you some additional information about mechanism than just looking at the pathways. You might start actually explaining why the pathways are going up and down. Um, and 
this is another example of a paper that Veronique and Shahina um, my, and uh, our group um, participated in where we took the gene expression data and used a tool that we're going to learn about um, similar to a tool that we're going to learn about on day three to predict the transcription factors that are important in the gene expression analysis and then map those targets to pathways in the same way that I just explained with the microRNA and again to see which pathways a particular transcription factor of interest might regulate. You can look at that paper if you're interested in more details. The autism example that I showed you this morning was made with this enrichment analysis idea and this in um, happened to use uh, these pathway databases just as an example um, to show how, what we did here and this is how many pathways we used. Um, we wouldn't use all of these uh, by default as I mentioned many times today. So pathway, uh, so Enrichment Map is a, an app that you can get for Cytoscape, a free app again. Um, it allows you to load up your results of GSEA or GProfiler and visualize them like this, fairly straightforward, um, in a fairly straightforward way. Um, once you've identified interesting pathways, you can zoom in on them, and this is what, how I kind of explained. Um, you might eventually uh, want to event, you know, eventually identify, so this is, the, this is the enrichment map. It gives you a bird's eye view or a, uh, an overview of the whole experiment. Um, you might identify a, a pathway or theme of interest, and then you can even go further and identify one specific pathway. So this is the reactome apoptosis pathway represented as a gene set, and it's just one little circle in this big diagram. But actually, if you go and look in reactome, it's a complicated pathway, um, and you can overlay your gene expression data on it, and you can identify more interesting information, like in this case, we realized that one particular complex in this pathway was really differentially expressed and uh, as opposed to some of the other, other things. Um, so um, uh, there's also um, a couple of additional apps that are, are available. I should have mentioned one called Auto Annotate. Um, we have a word cloud app that allows you to uh, help summarize the theme. So by default, Enrichment Map gives you uh, this map, but you don't have these bubbles that I show here, these bubbles. In this case, these bubbles were manually added, and this was a while ago. Um, now we have a system called Auto Annotate that automatically adds those bubbles, and it automatically chooses a label for the bubble based on the names of the pathways that it groups. Um, but you can also look at uh, all of those names and look at how uh, the frequency of different words in, the, in a in a, in a group of pathways using this word cloud app, and you might use that to get a better name for some of these annotations. Um, we'll go through that in, in the, um, in the um, lab. Um, Ruth Isserlin programmed this originally, and when she presented in a lab meeting, she was really excited and made a big to cookie uh, to bring to lab meeting about it, which I always like showing because um, she was so excited about <laughs> this, this software. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, that's the introduction to enrichment map. Mm -hmm.